Hello, my name is Melissa Lane. I am the Health and Temperance Leader at the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church in Saginaw, Michigan. Good morning. My name is Bobby Porter, and I'm one of the Health and Temperance Directors at Flint Fairhaven SDA Church. Welcome. We're so glad you could join us again today. May you be blessed today. Yes, thank you for joining us today as we continue our mental health series. Today we are going to be discussing anxiety. Now everyone experiences anxiety from some point in time in their life, whether you're taking a test or making an important decision. But when it starts to overtake your life where you cannot function on a day-to-day -day basis, that's where you need to start focusing and possibly seeking help. We do have a, a video that we're going to show with Dr. Jeff Baker, who will discuss signs and symptoms of anxiety, as well as uh, discuss some things that we can do to overcome anxiety. Let's go ahead and watch the video. So anxiety is one of those emotions that we all have that's kind of uncomfortable. It's very normal and natural. And it's whenever our safety and security is at risk. And it can be something physical, like when we're driving on the icy roads, or it can be something like it has to do with somebody's appraisal of us, like when we risk rejection or failure. And that's going to show up for all of us. And it's supposed to be there because it's there to protect me. It's there to help me understand that when I, when I feel my car kind of slide a little bit when I'm driving in downtown, that I should have that kind of fight or flight uh, sympathetic nervous system thing kick in. And I feel that and I, I, I correct my car. That's supposed to be there. Or when I'm uh, uh, approaching someone to, to introduce myself or if I'm making a pitch at work and doing a, a a speech like this one, that I should have a little bit of anxiety. I should have a little bit of that show up because I'm risking failure or rejection. When anxiety becomes a problem, it's because this very normal, natural thing, I begin to fight it or struggle it. So uh, rather than kind of making room for it to be in my experience, uh, like if I'm going to compete uh, in a soccer game or again, uh, make a business presentation, that I began to struggle with it. And rather get focused on my plan of what I'm gonna do, I start focusing on that feeling of anxiety and I develop a fear of the anxiety. And I start focusing on that and then several things happen. Number one, it amplifies. So I go from like a level three to a level seven. And when I'm a level seven, things get a little squirrely because I can push my pulse above 100. And when I do that, I start having that fight or flight mechanism kick in. And then my brain gets a little foggy. I'm not thinking very clear. I have all kinds of other negative feelings rush in because it gets so intense. And the other thing is I can stay there for a really long time because I get focused on it. And because I get focused on it, I kind of stay there. And whatever my brain gets focused on gets bigger. So then I, as I do that over time, I start doing two things. Number one, I start developing a habit of focusing and fighting it. And number two, I start avoiding things in life that stimulate that anxiety. So I reduce my life and not take the risks on the things that are important to me. So I end up having a life where I'm focused on being comfortable rather than focused on pursuing the things that matter most to me, which always involve usually taking some type of risk. I know, I know anxiety is a problem when the three Ds show up. The first D is deviant which means I'm behaving in a way that isn't normal. So if everybody else on the soccer team can go out and play, but I'm having a panic attack before I go out there, or I start to go out and I, I just, I'm not going on the field. Or if everybody else can do something that, that causes me extreme anxiety, that it interrupts my ability to do what everybody else can do, or what something that's important that I would like to do that other people do, and I don't.
I avoid it. Or I do it under great duress, which is the next D. I am so distressed by this thing that it feels wrong. It feels bad. I know inside somehow this feels wrong. And the last is dysfunction, meaning that it impairs the way I uh, live my life, that I can't do the things at work that I, sh I should be able to do or want to do, or at home, I'm not able to do the things that I want to do or should be able to do. Those activities become reduced or abandoned altogether. Anxiety shows up because I pursue something that matters a great deal to me. And as a result of pursuing that, I take a risk. And that risk of failure, that risk of rejection, my brain sees that as the same thing as a physical risk. Uh, a Bengal tiger and asking out a pretty girl, like when I ask out my wife the first time, they're the same thing to that lower part of my brain. Now, the upper part of my brain can tell the difference between a Bengal tiger and my wife. The lower part of my brain, absolutely they're the same thing because a physical risk and an emotional risk is exactly the same. So if I am to, to pursue the things that matter most to me, I'm going to produce that anxiety. The critical question is, what do I focus on? Do I, have I trained myself and learned to focus on the feeling of anxiety or the what ifs that are in my head, where they're like a gerbil wheel that'll make me crazy very quickly? Or, uh, or do I focus on the urge to escape and run away? And if I focus on all these internal stimuli, the thoughts, the feelings, or even the sensation of the, the butterflies that I feel when I feel anxiety, if I focus on that, it's going to get huge. And as a result of it getting bigger, it will stop me or impair my ability to do the things that matters to me. Or I can have those butterflies and those little feelings and kind of show up. And I can focus on the thing that's right here, right now, that's important that I want to lean into and do and commit to doing that, even though I might feel some butterflies. To manage anxiety on your own in that moment, it's, it's best to learn to catch it very early. Some people are very aware of what's going on in their head and they'll catch yourselves doing the what ifing thing. And you got to unhook from that very quickly because it'll make you crazy soon. Uh, so learning to unhook from that and kind of getting your mind back to being focused on what's in front of you. Or some people will notice the kind of tachycardia and the butterflies in their stomach. And again, being able to catch that quickly with some deep breathing and learning to do some stretching and muscle relaxation that you can do anywhere. It's called IBFN, Instant Better Feeling Maneuver, which is just learning to take that first deep breath and relax and control your breathing. Now, when you don't do that and you've kind of allowed it to kind of uh, ramp up and you've pushed your pulse over 100, you start dumping stress hormones in your brain. And when you do that, these, these catecholamines, these stress hormones kind of shut off your executive function, all your reasoning and thinking, and you'll kind of get a brain fog and it'll turn on the do not get killed part of your brain and you will end up in fight or flight. And then it's kind of a real crazy feeling where you're tingly and, and you feel wired. And that's going to be a different thing because it's going to take a long time for you to get your brain back. Uh, the quickest thing you can do is kind of breathe and get that back. But it's going to take about 16 hours for those stress hormones to be metabolized in your brain. But it can be done. The secret is not to do that very often. If you're doing it very often, you can even end up depressed along with anxiety because you're eating away some of those neurotransmitters that allow your brain cells to talk to each other. Some of the things that people can do when they're struggling with anxiety, 
uh, very practically are Pilates, yoga, any type of exercise, where what you're doing is an almost anti-anxiety activity that gets you focused right here, focuses on muscle stretching and relaxation, taking meditation and mindful classes, uh, even prayer, things like that that help relax and focus right here, right now, are fantastic. I also love people to learn the activities to mindfully live, meaning live focus, live in the present, learn to practice being present here so that when those things show up, you're not used to living your whole life swirling around in your mind. I believe prayer can be very powerful in managing anxiety. Uh, number one, it takes your head away from the what ifing in your brain that's kind of a squirrel cage. Uh, and number two, it, it, it moves us to an area where we trust. That somebody bigger than me, that because think of all the anxiety is about uncertainty. Our, our most uh, uh, intense fear is the unknown. Well, what if I had trust in somebody who did know and that I believe cared about me? Well, that can really help if I begin to focus there. Now, it's not very helpful if my prayers are focused on all my fears, okay? So I have to focus my attention on that which uh, allows me to feel cared about and trust where the uncertainties are part of an adventure that's been laid out for me that I can follow. And that it's okay to have uncertainty because that's where faith is. I just want to know the plan. I want to have some control here. He finds that very amusing, I think. So, you know, he's always laying out in front of me this uncertain life. And that's going to create a little anxiety, and that's okay. But that's where my faith can be if I will lean in and focus on trusting somebody who's in charge and, and control of all that, and I can believe that he loves and cares about me. There's a time for medication. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary because you may have practiced your struggle with anxiety enough that you have depleted some of the neurotransmitters that allow your brain to do what it does. Now, when that happens, uh, you may not be able to boost that thing naturally. So you may need a medication that's going to help you learn uh, to get that back while your neurotransmitters are being built back by the medication. And anti-anxiety medication is kind of an odd thing because you really can't get rid of it because it's supposed to be there. Very different than depression, which is not supposed to be there. Sadness is supposed to be there, but not depression. Anxiety always should be there. So when we take anti-anxiety medication, it really suppresses anxiety, but it also suppresses everything else. All the good feelings and the bad feelings. So anti-anxiety medication should be used sparingly. Uh, some of the SSRIs, antidepressants, are actually very good because it will uh, boost serotonin levels with helps with anxiety, but it doesn't suppress everything. Anti-anxiety medication can help you reduce the flooding. So you're not flooding so often. So you're not having that episode where your pulse is going above 100. So anti-anxiety medication can help you not flood so often, therefore dump all those stress hormones in your brain. And when you take a, an antidepressant, an SSRI or any of the tricyclics or any of those, what we can do then is build back some of the serotonin or norepinephrine or whichever neurotransmitters have been eroded by you dumping all these stress hormones in your brain often enough and frequently enough, we can help build those back. And that's essential if you're going to try to get your function back to normal. Your PCP, primary care physician, can help you make those decisions. And you know when you need that, when you can tell that your anxiety is very different than everybody else. Again, that's that word deviant, or it's distressful and you know this is wrong. You know the anxiety is so overwhelmed because it's, it's getting in the way of you functioning and it becomes dysfunctional because it impairs you from living your life and pursuing the things that matter most to you. When people have anxiety or any mental disorder that uh, actually becomes a disorder where they need to be helped, 
uh, it's the three D's that they are so abnormal. They're, they're deviant that they're not able to function, uh, as a normal person who's struggling with anxiety. Uh, they can't show up for work or when they do, they're not able to do their job. Are there actually maybe even a danger to other people or themselves? Their, their dysfunction is so, uh, out there that again, they may get hurt or hurt someone else or, or the inside, they, they know something is so wrong. Maybe they can't articulate it or put their finger on it, but they know something is really, really wrong in them. And when that happens, we need to move people into treatment. Uh, and sometimes, uh, I, I have, uh, as a psychologist, I have the power to put ho- people in the hospital against their will. And I, and I do that often because sometimes people can't make that decision. And sometimes you have to call 911 and they'll send a police officer and that police officer will make that decision to call the EMTs and they may have to take that person against their will. So one of the things about anxiety is learning to work with people who might have some anxiety. And if I know that anxiety is going to cause them to uh, avoid certain issues or at least end up in brain fog where they're not as sharp or using their potential, their IQ like they could, I want to try to not stimulate that anxiety by not being so threatening. So one of the things I need to learn to do as a leader is, is called warm startups. In other words, if I have an issue that I have to address about your performance or I got an issue that I want to, you and I need to get our head together, what I want to do is address that issue with warmth. I can say very clearly, specifically, concretely what I want. Uh, I shouldn't have to hint around. I don't have to treat you with kid gloves. I think that's a really bad idea. I need to be straightforward and concrete with you. However, I can also be warm. And warmth looks like this. Okay. It looks like this and it sounds like this so that I can say to you what I need to in a way that that would communicate with my body language and my affect that I'm saying this in a way that's also talking to a friend, somebody I care about, somebody that their their life means something to me. Now, if I'm doing this harshly because I'm doing it because of my own emotional reactions. I mean, that's just a little narcissistic. Uh, So that's a really bad idea because I'm only thinking about me and and, ah, that's a really bad leader. So I want to do this in a way that facilitates the cohesion in team. If I really care about being a leader and I really want this team to do well, then I need to do so with the intent of having cohesion with the people who are willing to be led by me. One of the things I've noticed in uh, the people who trained me, uh, which is a group of psychiatrists that were worth their weight in gold, is how they noticed when I was getting overwhelmed. Uh, I did a lot of work in the emergency room. And uh, the first couple of months that I was in the emergency room, nurses used to come up and pat me on the back and say, Dr. Baker, you know, you're going to have to breathe because I was like turning purple because the things that would come in and I would just go... You know, so uh, breathing was always important to do your work, and I was not. And so they were very kind to me in the first few months of my residency in the emergency room to tell me when to take breaks and when to kind of go catch your breath. Because some of these things I'd never seen before, smelt before, or, you know, had come close to because it was pretty raw. And they were so good to kind of coax me along and telling me when I needed to go, go get a cup of coffee or, you know, take that break, go and and breathe and kind of get your brain back and get back into it. And so that permission to kind of have that space uh, really helped that learning process. And and pretty soon I, I learned to adapt and adjust to the things you could see in an emergency department. But that learning process was involved with permission to take a break. That was another powerful video from uh, Dr. Jeff Baker. I like the way that he explains um, the way that people react and some things how um, may contribute to anxiety. Again, everyone has it. Everyone has experienced it. But 
when it overtakes your life, that's where the downfall comes. And it, you, you definitely need to be aware of certain signs and symptoms. When anxiety gets to the point where you really, it um, hampers how you function. Mm -hmm. And that's when we need to seek help. And there's nothing wrong with seeking help, as Dr. Baker said. Sometimes uh, either just talking to somebody, to an expert, who can help walk you through some steps that can be done. Maybe even um, a prescription. Help alleviate that. With seeking help through a psychologist, psychiatrist, yes. um, you just don't want to, you know, take something because someone has already had a prescription. Please don't take anybody <laughs> else's medicine. Please don't. No, we, we, we're not suggesting that. But um, make sure that you are aware of how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Be aware of your surroundings. And is this something that happens on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that just happens every couple months? And maybe stop and think about what's causing the anxiety. Um, if, if you're just really, really anxious, Stop and think about what's happening. What scenario are you in? Is it when a certain person comes up to you and uh, maybe touches you inappropriately, maybe cr or with their arms around your shoulders and you really don't want that? Or maybe it's somebody who just um, looks at you in a way that demeans you or even says something. So then you're anxious because you want people to think well of you. And, um, or is it when you're at work? and anxieties and pressures are put on you. So there's a lot of different reasons for anxiety. And uh, hopefully, number one, as we already said, you can talk to somebody and, um, and seek help. And just know that you're not alone. You're not the only one who's got anxieties. As Melissa has already said, we all have anxiety. And there are times when our anxieties get to be pretty high. So then if you can, if you can stop and think about what makes you feel better, what makes you feel at peace, you know, we have one more video to show you, and we think that it'll be a, we hope and pray that it will be a blessing. I've come to value truth like I never have before. Whether that's an easy truth or a hard truth to swallow, I have become in love with the truth. It was hunting season. Woke up in the morning, 4.30, 5 o'clock. The woods are still, you know, birds chirping. The trees aren't really swaying, it's just silence. And you know, silence can be a very painful place. I was already in a very anxious spot in my life. Thought everything was gonna be okay. It was just another hard morning. But the feelings of hopelessness and fear and the silence kind of consumed and slowly I became debilitated. I, I wasn't in control of my body anymore. And, and, and my brain and my mind went to this very foreign place. This, this vision that I was consumed with was the most tormenting thing in my brain and my mind that I've ever had before. It was, it was like I was in hell. I thought I knew what to do in this situation, but this was a whole other level of panic. And I slowly began to pass out. In the midst of panic, in the midst of an anxiety attack, you know, that's the result of your thinking. And that's why we have to really protect our thinking. When our amygdala gets turned on and starts firing stress hormone to help us cope, those hormones flood our frontal lobe and our frontal lobe is responsible for being rational, but it gets turned off because it gets flooded with stress hormone. And so your brain is in like a stress bath, basically. If your amygdala gets turned on too often, it means that your body is perceiving threat even when it's not there, and that's what an anxiety disorder is. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental health problem in the U.S. right now. About 20% this year will suffer from an anxiety disorder. And then the anxiety disorders have the earliest age of onset of any mental health problem. A typical age of onset is 10, 11, 12 years old. 
Whereas something like depression, the average age of onset is actually more in your 30s. So anxiety really tends to strike at a young age. My very first panic attack was in sixth grade. I still remember it to this day. I was in the cafeteria and I had my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and the anxiety hit me. I'm literally like, what's going on? Am I getting ready to die right now? I remember sweating, shaking, and trying to catch my breath. And I guess because I hadn't really been taught about mental health in any kind of a way at that point, I really didn't even know how to verbalize to anyone what was going on. I just knew that I feel really bad right now. I, I mean, I think the anxiety comes from a place of fear. A lot of my triggers do come from traumatic experiences. But then the strange thing about anxiety is that Sometimes there is no trigger. Sometimes I'm having a great day and boom, out of nowhere, my body is sending off this fight or flight response. It doesn't matter how perfect of a life or how perfect of a situation, if there's a chemical imbalance or something in your brain is firing incorrectly, you're going to end up with anxiety or any other mental condition. So what's the difference between mental illness versus just a simple symptom? And the way I look at it is, how is it impacting my daily functioning? Is it impacting my work, my sleep, my relationships? We all may experience anxiety or something like that, but is it starting to interfere with things that are important for my day-to-day -day functioning? Human fear makes anxiety tricky. If someone has bipolar, it's like, oh, this is definitely like a clinical thing happening. We know more now about the brain. We know this is definitely happening in their brain. Fear and anxiety are harder because like everybody's afraid. And then some of us have anxiety disorders. I would experience the heart race and the sweating, the heart palpitations because of an illusion of fear because of creating these scenarios of my, in my mind of people not accepting me and liking me. And I actually had just a, a period of yelling at God, like with all of my heart and soul. I really do not want to speak those words out of my mouth. Seth, you have a problem with anxiety. I was always fearful of that happening because I cared so much about what people thought of me. But I didn't really have permission and the safety. I didn't give myself the permission and the safety to confess that to people. And, but in reality, that was an illusion because people would love me and accept that part of me. Everyone has something that's eating at them. Everyone has something that they're trying to overcome and conquer. I just realized one day I've been bullied a lot of my life by fear and anxiety. And I've allowed the bullying to continue for way, way too long. And so it got to the point where I was like, man, yeah, I'm, I'm telling people, like, you know, like confessing. I'm letting people in. This thing's going to get exposed. This thing, this thing's going to get hit by a light that it's never seen before. though too that redemption and restoration are real so often I think the church ends up minimizing ongoing chronic suffering like mood disorders or addiction because it's scary and we don't want to do the hard work of wrestling with where is he in the darkness what does it really mean for the light to shine in the darkness and the darkness to not overcome it
Society pushes the idea of independence as the goal. It's this dichotomous kind of binary of either you're independent or you're dependent or codependent. And so I was like, well, I guess if I'm given the two of those options, then yeah, I want to be independent, right? However, I challenge my clients to reject that idea. And, and I actually start out telling them in the first session that independence is BS. You know, these myths of being self-reliant, self-made. I've yet to meet anybody who really is doing everything on their own. And I definitely don't meet people who sustain doing things completely on their own. And so instead of trying to figure out how do I do things on my own, what I want to figure out is, how do I have the right people around me to support me being the best version of myself possible? I'm going to still do the work, but I'm also going to incorporate support to make that sustainable. I think our community could be far less self-reliant far more okay with really doing life together, being real about struggle. When shame or struggle is shared, its power diminishes. <laughs> He's a big goofball. And I love it. <laughs> You want to try again? <laughs> <laughs> when I first told Terrence, it felt like I was breaking the news to him that I'm a broken person, basically. Do you want to go dance with mommy? Yeah. I thought maybe he would leave. Not immediately, but I thought that maybe he would start planning his his exit from the relationship, but he did the exact opposite and just opened his arms and said, come here, what do you need from me? And that was the biggest thing. So even with that confidence of knowing, okay, I just told my boyfriend and he was totally cool with this, I still wouldn't have told another soul. I was just afraid that people were going to look at me and, and think either, number one, that I'm lying because, well, look at you, you look fine. Or number two, well, we don't really want anything to do with you now because I don't want to have to deal with all of that mental health stuff that you're dealing with. I really believe that just as humans, we're not meant to go about any of this by ourselves. And that it really is BS to think that we all have to work in our own little silos and, and go through the hard times alone through making sure that you have a strong support system around you. The light at the end of the tunnel is so beautiful and free. So for, for me, recovery isn't knowing that oh, thank goodness, I'm never going to have a panic attack again. It's knowing I very well may have one in 15 minutes, but I'm prepared. Oh. Oh. Quinn, you're so big. <laughs> so for the person in the audience who may be thinking to themselves, do I have a mental illness? I've been there. You know, I've had that moment of kind of looking in the mirror and saying, how did I get to this place? Understand that there's a way out. Where I am is where I am right now. It doesn't mean it's where I'm gonna be down the road. There's hope, there's opportunity. Don't be afraid to get help. Anxiety is such a common problem, and yet it's also a very treatable problem. The great thing about the internet is you can easily do a search for anxiety treatment providers. That would be a great next step if you're trying to conquer anxiety. Sometimes for those of us who are in the space of helping, and by that I mean not professionally, just regular folks, I think it's important to realize that if somebody is vulnerable or somebody is struggling, you don't have to have the answers. You don't have to fix anything. 
The only thing you have to do is work to create and maintain a space where they can be open and be honest and be vulnerable with you. This is uh, my kind-hearted and beautiful wife, Kate. What does that look? Sorry, I'm not your wife yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Seth shared with me very early on about his anxiety. And even though it was like so early on, that didn't change at all the way that I felt towards him. I appreciated him being real and vulnerable with me. I can only understand, and I think like people in relationship with people with anxiety can only understand to a certain extent when you don't struggle with that yourself. But like for me, what I've found to be helpful is just being present with you, you know, and listening and trying to understand and praying with you and it's been challenging, but it hasn't ever scared you off. Scared me off or changed how much I care for Seth. Bless the Lord. <laughs> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. Be what really triggered me being vulnerable is the scripture about the truth setting you free. I believe that the Lord is offering an amount of grace that we can't even comprehend and understand. Suffering does not have the final word. It is not the biggest thing, although it is very, very real, and it is daily for many of us. We have a Savior who doesn't remain far from it, not when he was on earth and not now. I didn't expect life to be like this in a good way. I've just found that I'm able to live this life with the anxiety and with knowing that, yes, at any moment it can hit me, but knowing that I have all the tools, I have all of the people, I have all of the resources there to fight it. So my hope is that as we hear different people's stories, that we listen for the shared humanity, for the shared vulnerability, as well as the shared opportunity that we have to create a more whole and humane and healthy society. And that's just such a freeing thing. It's like, we're humans, like we're not perfect people. Like we're gonna have really crappy days and that's okay. We're gonna struggle with stuff and that's okay. Like, let's do it together. Let's just, let's just do it together. Let's just struggle together and, and get healed together and overcome together. And like, if we could only taste the freedom that comes from letting something in the light and letting people in that light with it, we would experience a joy that this world don't experience very often. Thank you for watching us today. We will continue our discussion this evening at 730, uh, where we will read off your questions if you have any. Also, if you need additional assistance, please reach out to either church's website. It's Saginaw Ephesus Church. You can go to ESDAC.org or Fairhaven in Flint. You can go to FairhavenSDA.org. Next week. We will conclude our mental health series and we will be will be discussing addiction. Have a blessed day.